Um, as Connie said, good morning, everyone, and welcome to what is the fifth Future Set Systemic Risk Masterclass uh, entitled Recognising Risk. Um, this is delivered to you by Lloyds in partnership with the Chartered Insurance Institute, the CII, and the Lloyds Market Association, the LMA. As Connie said in her introduction, I'm Andrew Brooks. I'm the Group CEO of Ascot, and I'm really delighted to be chairing today's masterclass. What is um, a really topical um, topic we're going to discuss. I'm joined by um, some very, very well-known people in their sectors. Um, I'm not going to do them the disservice of trying to introduce them personally, so I'm going to hand over to each of them to introduce themselves. But the topic we really want to discuss today is looking at systemic risk, looking at utility outages, um, really stemming from either a cyber attack or a space event, a uh, space weather event. And I'm delighted that the panelists we've got are experts in all their fields who can really help us have a profound discussion on this. So with that, I'd like to hand over first of all to Sandra to introduce herself, um, and I hope you all do enjoy today's session. Hello, I'm Sandra Chapman. I'm a professor of physics at the University of Warwick, and I work across all areas of plasma physics. I work on other things as well. The most important plasma physics we're going to talk about today is what happens in the solar system, and that's space weather. So I'm interested in looking at time series and trying to understand space weather and how likely events are to occur and what their impact might be. Thank you. Thanks, Sandra. Luke, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Sure. Thanks for having me today, Andrew. Um, hi, well, my name is Luke ogan -Larger. I work at Tokyo Marine Kiel and um, Lloyd Syndicate as an innovation underwriter. And uh, I suppose as an innovation underwriter, we, um, we, we develop new insurance solutions. We're, we're trying to um, meet the needs of our clients in this ever-changing world, whether that's through parametric solutions, looking at intangible assets, uh, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's quite an interesting area, and so that's going to be a good conversation. Thanks, Lee. Uh, Tracy? Thank you. I'm Tracy Skinner. I'm the Group Insurance Director for BT. Um, we really have, a, have a small team. We look after all of our um, general risks and we also, personally, I spend a lot of time in respect of cyber insurance. Thanks, Tracy. And finally, Scott. Hey, this is Scott Stransky from modeling company AIR Worldwide and also representing our parent company, Verisk. And I've been doing cyber modeling now since the target breach back in 2013. So we've been focused on building out models that, that can help the insurance industry understand financial consequences of systemic cyber events. Thanks, Scott. Um, and as Connie says, you all have a chance to ask the panelists questions using the Q&A feature. And we'll also be running a couple of audience polls um, through this presentation. Um, if you're tweeting or posting to LinkedIn today, uh, be sure to tag at Lloyds of London using hashtag future set, uh, sorry, Lloyds future set. Um, and before we get into the discussion, I'm going to actually open with a few thoughts on, uh, from my perspective, on recognizing risk and changing risks. But before we do that, we'd really, really like to get your perception on a couple of the scenarios we want to discuss today. So if you don't mind, um, could you go to slido.com on your device and use the code hash SM5 to go to our first audience poll where you can enter your answer to the following questions. First one is, how well prepared is your organization around the systemic threats that cyber or extreme space weather presents to critical infrastructure and utilities? Second question, what do you believe the potential economic, and that's important, economic, not just insured loss, economic impact of a large-scale space weather event or cyber attack could be? Please don't type your answer into the Q&A feature as they won't be included in the results. We'll have a look at these results in about five minutes. So just to repeat, go to slido.com and enter hash SM5 to get the poll up. So while you're doing that, I'm just going to give you a couple of thoughts from my perspective on sort of recognizing risk and the changing risk landscape. Now, what we tend to do is at ASCO is look at risks in three buckets, an A bucket, B bucket, and C bucket. A bucket for us is homogeneous standard risks. Um, we even include that sort of hurricanes and uh, earthquakes. 
And as Scott will allude to when we look at modelling, there is a massive correlation now between the output of models and the actual loss portfolio sustained in those type of events. Option B, bucket B, is where we have unmodeled perils and also losses where the perils are modeled, but the empirical data we get is still being constantly refined. And events that have happened in the last few years that really tested the, the, the correlation between models and your portfolios would be Hurricane Harvey, California wildfires, and actually the recent US storm, Storm Uri. We also put in um, bucket B, things like casualty clash, opioids, and certain cyber events. The scary bucket for us is bucket C, which is the systemic black swan bucket. And obviously that's where COVID fell into and has really taken the market by storm in terms of the mindset change it's caused. We would also put in there the events we're going to talk about today, which is uh, space weather and also extreme cyber events, not just from the events we've seen in the papers recently, but more state-sponsored cyber having uh, an implication of shutting down the internet for a, or GPS systems for a long period of time. When we look at risk, um, we have a sort of uh, a, a strat line, which is uh, called REMA, which is R, which is recognizing and respecting risk. I, and Tracy will know a lot about this and we'll talk about this, identifying your risks in your company. M, and Scott will be good at this, which will be model and managing your risks. And Luke can comment more on RA, which is action and addressing. And I think Sandra will pick up the R, which is really going to be something from where we're talking space, recognizing and actually respecting the risk does initially exist. So with, with COVID, um, I think we can all say sit here now a year after the events happened and said it's had a profound effect on everyone in society. But let's be honest, with COVID, there were warning signs before. And with the events we're going to talk about today, there have been warning signs before then. You had SARS, you had swine flu, you've had Ebola. They've even been put into dramatic films that we can actually see and witness. Even with World Trade Center, which was a previous global event, that world tragic event at World Trade Center, there was a previous attack on the uh, Twin Towers back in 1993. So when we talk about systemic risk, pre-COVID, there was always this perception, it won't happen on my watch, it's not something I need to worry about. COVID has brought that to the fore, that these events are sitting there, they are there, they need to be addressed and they need to be um, mitigated against. If you think about what COVID's done, it disrupted every single global supply chain, forever changed what our working environment. I mean, Tracy will be able to talk about the strain that it, the home increase of internets put on companies like BT. It's impacted every single individual from any walk of society. It's had an effect on every single business, some positive for someone like Amazon, but mostly it's been negative. But we found a way to adapt. And if you think about that, that was the internet working from home. Society has got through this. But just imagine when we talk about some of the events we're going to talk about, that that was not the case. Just imagine there is no internet for a few weeks. There is no GPS system. There's no telecommunication systems. And when we look at that today, we need to really think about how we're going to deal with those issues. It is scary, um, and we can't walk away from it, and we need to address it. So we've got to recognize the future risks, mitigate them really before they happen. Now, if you think about what we're going to discuss, um, something like a cyber event causing a huge utility outage, um, if you ask most risk managers, cyber is number one on their risk register. It might not be to the extreme of bucket three systemic risk, but cyber is right up there. Not surprising, 2019, you had um, the Maersk attack, you had the British Airways attack, you've even had public sectors attacks um, like the NHS. And more recently, as Scott just said, you, you know, you, you're leading on to CNA and you're leading on to Microsoft. So you've got events that are continuously happening. They haven't been at the systemic level, but we should all be realizing that that could happen at any point in time. And even extreme geomagnetic, ge geomagnetic solar system storms, they can happen. And they could shut down GPS. They could stop all transport for a week, for months. And again, the UK government, 
has actually put um, severe space weather as one of the highest priority natural hazards on the UK risk register. So again, we need to be recognising these events are out there and can happen. And it's not just about recognising risk, it's actually appreciating how the risk is changing. I, w- I was staggered to read that 90% of all the assets in the S&P 500 are now intangible assets. That's $21 trillion of assets. And also when we talk about intangible assets, physical assets that we're all used to insuring, like buildings, are changing. And Luke will pick up on this. You now have cloud exposure. You have brand exposure. These are now the new physical norm. And it's up to the insurance industry now to really adapt and change to recognizing risk, but also appreciating that the types of risk are changing and how are we going to provide products to do that. Um, and it's up, on, it's, 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 it's up to all of us to actually do that and then actually help risk managers with all this information and impart our knowledge and risk managers' knowledge to make sure society is protected going forward. Um, and to that end, last year, Lloyd's produced an excellent report called Protecting Intangible Assets. It's preparing for, it's called Preparing for a New Reality. The report set out how COVID has increased companies' exposure to new risks, many of which, as we said, are now intangible assets. And I would really, really recommend it uh, following up on today's masterclass. So without further ado, um, before we go further and we get on to the Q&A, let's go back and just have a look at the results from the poll, if we could. Have we got the poll results? Yes, I'm just sharing them now. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Okay. That's one thing coming up. Okay, so somewhat prepared, 54%, unprepared, 21 well-prepared, 20 I think very well-prepared, 4%. Um, I think that just highlights a lot of the issues we're all facing um, and we need to address. That is um, somewhat prepared is uh, the winner by a mile. So with that, let's think about how that economic cost is going to uh, transcend from those results. Wow, that is um, pretty incredible. If you think about COVID uh, as, as, a, as an economic loss combined with the insurance loss, it, it's the highest it's going to be is about $200 billion. Um, Many people saying that the insurance loss is going to be less than that now. So we have 41% saying $2 trillion. So I think <laughs> that is... Um, probably where we all need to put our mind's eye in how we actually manage our businesses and mitigate risk, because I think we all agree that we all, whether you're on the insurance side of the fence or the risk management side like Tracy, we all face significant exposures to this. So that is incredibly interesting. So without further ado, um, I think we should get into the main event today, which is really um, sort of the Q&A discussion we're going to have with the panellists Um, Obviously, um, as we said at the beginning, there is the opportunity for you to um, ask Q&A. And as Connie said, please submit your questions through the Q&A section. Don't put down which panellist you want to uh, refer to. Um, We will actually address those as they come in. So without further ado, um, before we move on, um, I'd just like to say a few words about some of the panellists because I think they didn't do themselves the service they probably deserve. Um, for those of you who don't know, Sandra um, has given some fantastic speeches, and I would recommend uh, you going online and having a look at them. In 2014, Sandra gave the Royal Astronomical Society James Dungy Lecture, and in 2020, the Ed Lorenzo Lecture at the American Geophysical Union. Um, I actually looked at the second one on Friday, and it's incredibly interesting, and it 
discusses something called the butterfly effect, which we're trying to um, focus on today. Um, Luke didn't mention that um, he actually sits on the Lloyd's Product Innovation Facility, which is an amalgamation of 27 syndicates looking at trying to adapt insurance products for the new world we're entering, things like cloud outage. Uh, and Tracy, not in addition to her fantastic role she has at BT, she's also the chair of AMIC. And, and actually, she's been chairing AMIC through COVID, which is going to be extremely enlightening for us to listen to. And as Scott said, he is one of the industry experts on cyber modeling. Um, very excited to hear about how the modeling for state-sponsored cyber is going to be um, uh, addressed. So without further ado, um, the first question um, is going to be to you, Tracy, if you don't mind. Um, what are the key risks to critical infrastructure and utilities? And how are these risks changing? e.g. with the increased digitalization and changing working patterns that we've seen as a result of COVID. Maybe if you could give that from the context of where you sit at BT, but also in your role as chair of AMEG, that'd be extremely interesting for the group. Yeah, okay. So I'll talk through some of those things. Thanks, Andrew. So um, for sure, you know, the, the risks here are absolutely huge. Um, and without doubt, um, COVID has heightened the risks significantly um, uh, from a cyber threat in terms of the way the network was configured, okay, the way that we all generally work and the network configuration around large towns and cities and the way your own platforms were configured for the organizations you work for. They were mainly configured for you to work in an office environment in a major city or town and for you to randomly carry out work at home on an ad hoc basis. But by far, you know, the majority of your activity, it was, the network was designed for that to happen in an office environment. Okay, And all of the tools that support your IT platforms okay, have all been configured for that use. Okay, so if you um, if you are using certain platforms, you're actually ex exposing yourself potentially by working in a very different way for long periods of time. So not only is there risk because you may be, you know, in certain countries the risk can be larger. So in India, for example, um, you know the net the, the remote network is is very immature. Um, that that makes it quite difficult to build in you know, the extra security and layers and platforms that are needed. Okay, So this entire situation is, um, is really uh, creating um, an exposure which is far more significant than usual. Okay, I will just talk through a little bit because I think you're interested, um, Andrew, in the AMIC situation in terms of um, if you can imagine the challenge of being a chair of an organization that is reliant on networking and events for its income, um, for a significant slice of its income. Um, so obviously, COVID struck um, two significant events of the year and, and a conference in June and a dinner in December were no longer going to happen. Um, it, was, it was incredibly important, very small sector small but very successful and you know worked in very hard secretariat team um, were able to sort of engage around this immediately to bring us some kind of number two in terms of the uh, conference which was an online event called AMIC Fest which I have to say was very very popular um, with our members it was very very popular with uh, the insurers and, um, and partners that support us, okay? But in terms of making a comparison to uh, that event and what a conference would have brought AMIC in revenue, there is just no comparison whatsoever. So it is you know, quite obvious that um, in some ways as well, the partners uh, missed out on what, what is more difficult in this environment, which is to um, basically switch into a platform where it is very difficult to network on, in this environment. So that was a thing that we attempted, okay, but it, it was probably the least successful thing of AMIC Fest and probably the thing that the partners value the most from the conference. 
So, you know, moving forward, I know it's going to be a different type of world, but, you know, the feeling is, is that there's still very much an appetite for when it's safe to do so, we will get back together and we are planning an event to take place in October of this year. So, um, yeah, that's that's really sort of an overview of, of, of you know, the dramatic impact on um, businesses that are reliant on face-to-face -face activity. Thanks, Tracy. I think we'll all be trying to support that event in October because AMIC is uh, hugely valuable to the insurance industry. It's a great way we can connect with risk managers like yourself. And I think from all of us, you know, thank BT for the amazing work they've done in uh, the infrastructure changes that you implemented so quickly, allowing us all to work from home. So phenomenal achievement. Um, Sandra, if we could come to you, um, what effects could space weather have on Earth and uh, what types of space weather could have the greatest impact? Um, and again, at some stage, if you could weave in the, the sort of butterfly effect you discussed in the, um, in the, in the lecture you gave would be fantastic. Thank you. Okay, so, so what I'll try and do, obviously there's a lot of details that you won't want, so I'll try and just talk you through what happens when a space weather event happens and what we're, what, what's predictable about it and what is not predictable about it. Okay, so what happens, so it all originates at the sun, so as you may know, you may have seen these lovely pictures of solar flares, so you get an eruption on the sun. Okay, you don't know when this will happen. You might see, we observe the sun all the time, you might see something brewing you don't know when it's going to happen. The minute this happens, it will produce a uh, radio burst. So a radio burst, within eight minutes, this reaches Earth. This can jam radar and, and radio communication. So very little warning, eight minutes of the flare, you, there have been incidents of jamming, sort of aviation, so shutting airports, the planes can't land. Because if you happen to be just, it's just when the sun's rising, your radar happens to be just looking along the surface of the Earth at the sun, that's happened. There's also kind of for the military some consequences there that I'll elaborate on if people are interested. And, it, and even that prompt radiation can affect the Earth's ionosphere. It can accelerate charged particles. They will arrive uh, in minutes to hours. If you happen to be on the way to the Moon or Mars, that's a lethal dose, okay? If you're protected by the Earth's own environment, then as long as you're not flying over the poles, you're probably okay. But, you know, you have to reroute aircraft. Again, that can mess up satellites. You know, you can get either single failures in satellites or they can actually damage satellites irrevocably. And, and that will turn up in minutes to hours. Then what happens? Big ball of plasma will come towards the Earth. And you'll see it coming. So you'll know it's coming. But the problem is the Earth is really small on the scale of the solar system. So this thing could just miss. It could look as if it's coming. And it can miss us completely. So the chance of a false alarm is quite high. It's only when it gets close to the Earth because the satellite kind of parked upstream, we can tell what this thing is like. And it's only then, uh, when it's quite close to actually impacting, we'll know what kind of impact it might have because it, it's not just the, the looking at it. You have to know it, what the structure of the thing is like magnetically and how it fits the Earth. When it arrives, if it's geo-effective, in other words, it's of the right orientation to affect the Earth, you will... Uh, do a number of things, and the most important, I think, to talk about are affecting the ionosphere. This affects any communication between ground and satellites like GPS, okay? So it will affect GPS timing because it takes the time the signal to, to, from the Earth to satellite, it will mess that up. Um, GPS timings, anything that relies on that, uh, it might kind of actually disrupt GPS. Uh, other kinds of satellite communications as well. Um, also, if you use the ionosphere to bounce low frequency signals to talk to the other side of the earth, it will affect that, it may just block it out. Again, both civil and military. Um, the other thing is it will create the lovely aurora that you will see is like a big electrical current in space. So any long piece of wire on the earth will have an induced current and this is where the power grid gets affected. Okay, so you can some induce changes in the current flowing on the grid. You can actually damage the grid. This is, rate, this is blackouts of power. Uh, also, things like railways, again, long pieces of wire, anything like this. Um, and again, you're never quite sure how effective it's going to be because it depends where you are. If this thing happens over the Pacific, then nobody's that worried, okay? If it happens over, you know, the eastern seaboard of America, then you, you can have major blackouts. And so things you probably heard of the nine-hour Quebec blackout was this kind of thing. 
Okay. Now, I would kind of divide, if you think of your ABC, I try and divide these things into um, annoying and expensive, okay, and catastrophic, okay. So a Quebec nine-hour blackout, I would put, okay, it's annoying and expensive. I mean, it's expensive, but you can recover from it, okay. And in fact, Quebec is now claimed they've spent money. Now they know what it's going to cost. They would say, if that event happens again, actually, we're protected against it. They spent money making the grid resilient. So annoying and expensive, if you can figure out what the risk is, which is tricky, and what the, the, the cost would be, then you can make a decision about spending money making your things resilient. Satellites, again, there are famous examples where the military satellite has recorded everything that happened right next to the civil one that got killed by the event because they spent money rad hardening it. So there's a, there's a kind of cost-benefit thing there. Um, the, the catastrophic, and these are more like people to one in 50, one in 100-year events, are going to be difficult to prepare for. This, this is where you, you lose, you know, so, you know, so one in 50 event people, people try to rerun historical events for the technology we have now. And there's a lot of interest in this. So like this is famous 1921 event. If you ran it now, you would lose um, the, the power grid over to a third of the US, all across the eastern seaboard, you know, all across LA, that kind of thing. So you could rerun these events to try and work out well, what would happen now. And then that's quite hard to recover from. Those are, those are rarer. And again, there's a lot of debate on how you actually assess the risk of them. There are, there's one last thing I'll throw in, and that's um, the solar cycle. So we are currently at minimum. So the, the activity in the sun varies roughly at 11 year cycle. Uh, we've just passed minimum. When is the sun going to get active? Maybe, I, I kind of looked at it yesterday for this. Maybe next spring you will start switching on. So we can say something roughly about the risk is going to go up and roughly when. Okay, that's kind of an aggregate. With numbers like that could be, you know, put on things. We don't know exactly. We don't know how active the next cycle is going to be. The predictions are all over the place. It could be quite like the last one could be much worse. So, okay, so, so that's kind of what one can say about that. The butterfly effect is that you have a thing that I'm just describing where you have coincident extreme, so different things happening, you know, to different parts of the system, more or less at the same time, which are decoupled from each other in terms of the physics, but in terms of the systems can become coupled. So if you, if you, you know, if you block radar communications to avionics and you have a power cut at the same time, then suddenly what was a kind of controllable risk. Now, when these things couple together, so it's when extremes become correlated, then it gets extremely tricky to figure out how, what to do and how bad it's going to be. And I, I think some of our other panel members might say something about that as well. Okay, so that's me for the start. Thanks, Sandra. That's really interesting to be able to put them in the different buckets. I think that's a really good way we should be thinking about yeah. these exposures. And um, I think, as you say, the extreme ones are something we need to think about. Yes, they're rare. Um, but they are out there and they, we should be trying to address them. So uh, incredibly interesting. And I guess, Scott, that rolls nicely into to your field of, you know, how, you know, we actually start to model these these events, um, you know, from, a, from, from the effects on society and economies. Um, be really interested in your views from a cyber perspective and a space perspective of, you know, how well prepared you think we are with the modeling at the moment. So, so I think there is a full spectrum of modeling here, going from individual risk events all the way to really catastrophic things that are almost not even worth modeling because if they happened, there would be other consequences beyond the insurance industry that, that we wouldn't even be able to deal with. So starting at the small side, and I'll, I'll work through the spectrum. On the small end, you have cyber events that impact a single risk at a time. We've seen many, many, many of these. We've seen Target, Capital One, Anthem. In the UK, we had Talk Talk. These things are happening all the time. Uh, companies just get breached. From an insurance perspective, it's a big deal. It can cause full loss on an insurance tower. However, it's not going to be an aggregation event. If you have TalkTalk Talk getting breached, that's not going to impact the other insurance policies that you're writing. Though it could easily cause a limit loss for the TalkTalk Talk insurance policy. Then you get a little further down the spectrum. You get to correlated types of events. We saw in the United States last fall that there was a, a correlated ransomware attack on hospital systems. So for those who aren't familiar with ransomware, basically what happens is it encrypts a computer and the bad actor charges a payment in order to get that, that data back. 
Now you can either pay that payment and likely get the data back, or you can restore your systems from backups if you have good systems. And the insurance industry can help recover uh, a lot of the costs associated with it. Now, a correlated ransomware issue leads to, to more than just one policy being paid out at the same time. So these bad actors were targeting multiple hospitals. And if you insure multiple hospitals, you do have that correlation effect in your portfolio. Moving a bit further down the spectrum, you have an event like the 2017 NotPetya event. This is more of a systemic ransomware event, and it impacted lots of companies at once. In fact, many famous companies that all seem to start with the letter M, Merck, Maersk, Mondelez, um, and these companies suffered a tremendous amount of downtime during the NotPetya event. Effectively, NotPetya was a propagating ransomware where the bad actors didn't have to go after a single company one at a time. It was really self-propagating. You could think of it like a virus or a worm or uh, something that, that you don't even have to worry about from, from an individual bad actor. The bad actors just let it go. And what we saw with this event was multiple billions of U.S. dollars of loss. In fact, from an insurance perspective, it, it totaled about $3 billion U.S. dollars of loss. But the ground up or economic loss was on the order of $10 billion U.S. dollars. So, so we're, we're gaining uh, loss amounts as we go down the spectrum. If you think about an individual risk event, those are in the hundreds of millions or maybe up to a billion in the very worst case. But then what could be worse than that? Well, we've seen some recent events that people were a little concerned with. We saw solar winds. Don't get solar winds confused with solar storms. Solar Winds is a company that managed security systems for lots of other organizations, including governmental organizations and corporations. And the bad actors figured out a way to make the automatic update feature of Solar Winds uh, effectively update your system with a, a vulnerability. They hacked into that automatic updater. So therefore, everybody who was doing the right thing, getting updates from Solar Winds, actually got introduced to a virus or a, a, a vulnerability. And this led to all sorts of data being exposed. Now, at least from what we understand today, the bad actors weren't going after credit card data. They weren't going after health records or things that we've seen from previous breaches. Instead, they were going after trade secrets or intellectual property. And this takes us to a whole new realm. And I'm sure Luke will touch on this from an insurance perspective. But at least today, it's very difficult to insure intellectual property. It's much easier to insure downtime, business interruption. It's much easier to insure lost records and things. So the insurance industry may not be totally prepared for the, fi the financial consequences of a solar wind like event, which could be extreme from an economic perspective, but not nearly as extreme, at least from today's insurance perspective. But then we get to the far end of the spectrum, and we saw in the poll earlier that people believe these losses can be trillions of, of U.S. dollars. So, so what does that event even look like? Well, we've postulated many of these types of events, uh, in fact, in my line of work, it's kind of scary. We think about what is the worst thing that could ever happen and then model it. Um, but we, we lose a lot of sleep over the events that we're modeling. They are rare events, but they could happen. So what does this multi-trillion dollar event look like? It's unlikely to impact just affirmative cyber insurance, meaning you're writing a cyber policy to cover records lost or downtime. It's probably not going to get you to multiple trillion, trillions of dollars. But what it could look like is an event that crosses lines of business. It impacts property insurance. It impacts life and health insurance, marine insurance, aviation, et cetera, all at the same time. And there's many ways that you can get there. Bad actors can target systems that are connected to the real physical world. And there aren't that many of these systems out there. So if they figure out a vulnerability in one of them and, uh, and make that into an aggregation event, that's how you get to these trillions of dollars of loss, especially if you can manage to make things melt down or burn down. That, that's, that's the way that we see getting to that. There is no such aggregation event in history. However, there are a few ways that we can justify that this is plausible. Back in 2014, we, we've heard about this German steel mill attack. There's very little information about the German steel mill. It's, this, uh, it's not hypothetical. It did happen as far as we know. But it's uh, a bit of a story because we don't know too many of the details about it. But hackers managed to get into this German steel mill and cause it to physically melt down uh, because they, they changed some of the settings, the configuration of the steel mill. Of course, that was a one-off situation, but there aren't that many industrial control systems software products out there. So if the bad actors did manage to get into a common one of these and cause that to happen to lots of companies, that's how we, we can see getting to these trillions of dollars of loss. So I don't want to scare people too much, and uh, I'm sure we'll talk about some of the ways that we can help mitigate against this as we go through the rest of today. Thanks, Scott. I think you're right. The, the trillion 
dollars. I think people generally believe that is a, a, a situation that can result in some of these events. So I think it's well worth having the discussion. So thank you for that. Um, Luke, from your perspective, as Scott said, um, obviously the insurance industry is here to mitigate a lot of these exposures. What, what products do we have available at the moment? And what do you think the market should be moving towards to develop to help um, mitigate some of these perils that we're, we're discussing, cyber and, uh, and solar? Certainly, uh, Andrew. Um, there's an awful lot to digest there, actually. Um, but it was really informative. I, I, I think it was brilliant. I, I suppose, firstly, from an innovation standpoint, and I, I think innovation is potentially the, the answer to large systemic risk initially. But for me, I, I see innovation as more capturing systemic risk in a more controlled environment in which we can learn more specifically as to how these systemic risks behave over the longer term. And then gradually, as we get more comfortable, we can increase our line sizes and so on and dabble into the different types of systemic risks out there. Fundamentally, I, I think loads will always be low in, in so far as we, we have a, we, we like to syndicate our, our, our risks. Uh, and as you mentioned earlier, we, we've got the product innovation facility, which I think is a perfect home for, for this sort of stuff. In so far as we, we have 27 syndicates who have all come together and, and said we want to innovate together. And I, I think it's probably the, the world's worst kept secret in, in so far as when it comes to product innovation, it's all about putting our customer at the heart of product development. We, we want to learn about their needs and really understand and flesh things out. Um, in terms of IP, I, I know Scott earlier you, you mentioned IP. We didn't know that we actually do have um, some IP insurance products from defensive, defense uh, costs uh, for infringement uh, and so on. So that, that is an option. But then, as you said, we, we've got the intangible assets. We, we, we've got cloud. I think cloud's a really interesting area as well at the moment, insofar as, as Scott was mentioning earlier, it, it's the, the correlation between exposures. And at the moment, we have a product which we can actually look at how the systemic risk within cloud at a more granular level, more at CSP region, so individual data centers situated around the globe. And, and that's quite helpful because more than one insured may rely on AWS or Google Cloud. And so there, there is correlation there, and it's a case of really understanding how, how that behaves because I, I think everyone here would probably agree that maybe 12, 24 months ago, we'd never really heard about cloud computing, but there, there's clearly a trend in so far as everyone's now working from home and businesses are working towards a more lean structure in so far as deploying their IT resources to a third party, such as Amazon or Google or Microsoft Azure. And so there are exposures there which would only exacerbate in the future with, with further adoption. But I think ultimately, for us, it's syndicating these risks in, in a cold, controlled environment, trying to really understand it through proof of concept uh, and so on and so forth. And then we gradually can get to a position in which we can help our clients and protect their balance sheets. Thanks, Luke. Um, Tracy, um, I think looking at that poll result and listening to the context of Sandra, Scott, and, and Luke there, you know, but obviously BT is one company, um, and obviously you're going to be well prepared and looking at a lot of these these exposures. But generally, from your um, emic position, how well do you think companies actually perceive these risks um, and and view them? Um, do you think there's a lack of understanding from risk managers at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that I, 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 playing off to your question, Andrew, is I think very differently from company to company. Okay, I think there are some companies that are very well versed um, on probably the risk that it was, you know, six, twelve months ago, maybe. Yeah, and are kind of catching up with uh, what COVID has meant for that risk for them and the changes that COVID has brought and the way of working has brought. Has, has brought. I think there are other organisations. Um, and I don't really know why this is, but I think there are other organisations who aren't there, okay, who, because of the way that they're structured, because of the way information feeds up and down the organisation, um, I think the full implications of the potential uh, of, of an issue um, are, are just, you know, not filtering into you know, the, the decision makers in order for them to understand you know, what they should be doing about things, mitigate things, and actually, you know, look at, you know, the, the, the 
uh, tools available to them, both with insurance and other tools, um, to to actually assist. Um, and I think, you know, I think sometimes, you know, I think uh, risk managers like myself don't don't push hard enough um, to to get their voices heard. Um, and I think part of the problem at the moment on the risk side is I think the COVID risk, although it was on some risk registers, it was quite low down. Um, I think on others it was it was creeping its way up. But I think at the start of this um, COVID situation, I think there was real kind of embarrassment really in the risk management industry about you know, that situation, about it you know, not really you know, being up there. I think I think, the, I think that messaging has now changed completely. I think now many, many organisations are really beginning to value their risk teams and they are getting a far higher profile. It's kind of like, you know, we are where we are. What we've got to do is start to, to address and build the future. So I think in that respect, COVID... Um, although at the, the start of this, obviously, it was quite a negative event for people. I think as things have gone on and, you know, there has been a, a new dawn, so to speak, as to the benefits of sound risk management governance and practices. And I think as a result of that, um, these issues um, will start to... Um, yeah, I think these issues will start to filter up in an organisation in the in the exact way that they should through the board and audit um, committees. So I think I think yeah, that there is some positive to take away. I, I absolutely agree with that. I think it's the whole sector, you know, if you think of, uh, from my perspective, everything apart from hospitality has adapted extremely well to COVID because there was a there was an out. I think I think you're absolutely right, Trace. I think people need to look at the the real systemic risk now and go, if you don't have an out, which is what Sandra's talking about and Scott are talking about, if you have one of these catastrophic events, um, yes, they might be so catastrophic that, you know, you talk about sort of, you know, Darwin's in them again, but for most events, there needs to be a realisation they are there and then they need to be quantified. And I think you're right, there's going to be far more board debate now. So I think actually some good will come of this. And, and I guess on... As well. Yeah, sure. I, I think that was a really interesting point, Tracy. I, I think I, I love the idea that risk managers now have more of a voice because I suppose even within the Lloyd innovation community, we, we uh, created something called an initiative called Future Minds, in which we had over 100 participants from the underwriting, broking, but more importantly, the, the element community. So Julia Graham's helped us with assigning us or working closely with risk managers. And again, it's that tripartite product innovation sprint really understanding the client needs and then developing product for that area. We've actually seen some products launch off the back of that. So it's really exciting to hear the work on your end. I mean, it's without a doubt, I've been involved in some of those discussions myself, Luke, and that is where you really feel that the rubber is, is, is really beginning to touch the road. Because, you know, if I, if I look at BT's risk register and I look at the ability for the insurance market to respond to... Um, we respond to our risks. It's the, what, what we can actually ensure at present is a fraction of of our of our risks, um, and that fraction has gradually got smaller as the years have gone on. As we've already said, our reliance on the intangible grows, our reliance on tangibles shrinks, and we have gone through that situation where yeah we are yeah we are uninsured for most of the risks on our risk register. And anything, although cyber kind of brought us back a little bit once that was available, we kind of, you know, we, we carried on, um, you know, developing, innovating, and making ourselves more intangible. And therefore, it's continued to sort of still shift in terms of what's not insured. So actually, when you start those discussions, it's a really healthy way of, um, of understanding, you know, what the issues are and how to sort of address them. Brilliant. That's a very good point that you both raised. I mean, even from, you know, what are predictable events now in Bucket A, we were talking about, you know, uh, quakes and hurricanes. If you look at the economic loss to the insured loss, um, the delta is huge. So there's definitely a gap we all need to start plugging and working together on. But I think that's, you know, where society and business need to sort of think about their own. 
I guess, Sandra, if we think about that, where, where do you think society and businesses are with the threat to um, severe space weather and um, ge geomagnetic solar storms and everything? Um, so I think, I think there's a kind of, of there's, there's information out that there's an overall idea. So, for example, now um, space weather is in, the, is in the risk register. So now the Met Office is tasked with predicting space weather in the same way they predict, you know, the weather on the Earth. You know, they're, they're developing a capability for universities to do that, okay? And that will be something offered to users. So things like this, that, that can kind of help you in the kind of, you know, the um, uncomfortable and expensive but not catastrophic risk because you can, you can do things to your, you can switch off satellites. You, you, can, you can do things to the power grid to make it safer, you know, if you know what's happening. So, so there is quite a lot of work going on, and that will improve. Um, in terms of like the, the kind of more catastrophic or even kind of in the middle events, there's a lot of effort trying to go back in time and use long time series to, to talk about overall risk. And in that case, it's basically just saying the overall risk. How, how, what is a one in a hundred year event? What is a one in 50 year event? But not when it's going to happen, just what is it? What is it? Um, but when you do that, I think the, the thing that I think is, is interesting as well, um, and I, I am not an insurance expert, so I don't know how you do this, but of course, what happens, the impact on some infrastructure depends on how resilient it is and how much effort has been put into making it resilient. And you can do that before the risk happens. Uh, and one way of doing that is, I think, I think the Navy do this. They, they run scenarios for their worst days. Okay, so you can say, well, let's look at our worst day. Let, let's look at the, the sort of 1921 event and what would happen if that happened now. And, and you can run it through in detail. I mean, people are doing this in general terms, but you could run it through your system. And you could say, okay, we, if we did this, this, and this to our power grid, it would be now be resilient. You don't have to wait for the Quebec blackout before you improve your power grid. You could do it now, but it, there's a cost. So it seems to me there's a balance between the cost of building in resilience to the cost of the insurance if you don't. And that's and in terms of this kind of protecting these kind of systems where lots of things are coupled together, which is where we're going with this, that seems to be quite an important part to it. And I'll be interested. I say I'm not an insurance expert. What, what people's views are on about that, because it could really drive, you know, society into making their systems more resilient if that's more cost effective, rather than waiting for something to happen and then insuring it afterwards. I'm just that would be interesting. Well, I think Sandra, there's a there's a lot to be said for that. A lot of the Lloyd's charity work that we've been doing over the last few years is actually actually trying to retrofit houses in pro, poor prone areas. Um, rather than waiting for the event to happen, is actually getting ahead of the curve. And I think, you know, what you're saying is, is really important. And I guess, Scott, a lot of the modeling we could get around this and looking at the outputs would help us go and look at some of these issues. I mean, I always remember after World Trade Center, everyone had to have a disaster recovery center. And to your point, Sandra, everyone said, oh, we've got one. And then we had this catastrophic occasion where everyone went, right, let's go and simulate what happens. You all turn up at the um, center, and actually, they've sold the space 20 times over. And actually, you can't even get into the building. So I think actually thinking about uh, addressing a lot of this and mitigating risk is something we should really, really focus on as, as you know, the insurance industry and risk managers. And, and Scott, I guess on sort of modeling, you know, where do you think that that could lead us to discussions on sort of you know encouraging risk managers to look at extreme events and sort of go and question you know their infrastructure and everything? I mean, modeling is is a great way to look at the risk. And I, I'm going to say one of my favorite quotes. Uh, this is by a famous statistician, George Box, who is actually my former manager's thesis advisor. So I'm only one step removed from him. But what he said was that all models are wrong, but some are useful. And I think the second part of that is really the key, that some models are really useful. And we do our best to build very useful models for the insurance industry and for corporations to use as well. And I think that all starts with the data that goes into the model. There's different types of data that you need to build models. There's what we call firmographic data, which is basic data on companies' businesses. So it's the revenue or the turnover of a company, the employee count, what industry they operate in. It's the really basic stuff that, as an insurer, you probably can collect this anyway about a risk, but it's good to have uh, an additional verification of it. I think the more exciting data source that we have is what we call technographic data. And this is really valuable as we're thinking about modeling. Now, technographic data gives us information on the cybersecurity practices of companies. 
And we can get this from the outside in without a company's knowledge or even their permission being required. So you may wonder, how can we possibly do this? And we're not hacking. That's not our jobs. We're not doing anything illegal. We're not doing anything under the covers. But we're on, in the public part of the Internet, and we've deployed sensors in the public part of the Internet to try to capture this data. Uh, there's a lot of analogies I can use for this. Sort of think about standing outside an office building on the public sidewalk, and as people leave the office building, maybe not during COVID, but before COVID, as somebody leaves the office building, you ask them where they headed. So if somebody's headed from uh, a company's office to Amazon Cloud in the virtual sense, that's good. We know there's a connection between that company and Amazon Cloud. But if they say they're headed from this office building to the drug lord's house, that's probably a little less ideal. There's probably something sketchy going on inside the building. Now, in the virtual sense, maybe they're headed from a company's network to a command and control center for a ransom uh, operation or, or some sort of evil website. But so we can sense that using these sensors. And we can collect a lot of this raw data on hundreds of thousands of companies around the world in near real time and build up profiles of companies to really understand, are they cyber resilient or are they not cyber resilient? Are they going to be doing a good job after they get a breach or a bad job? None of these things can tell us for sure if you're going to have a breach or not, but they certainly are predictive of breach. And we've done some correlation studies and things to prove that this data is actually informative and useful for predicting breaches. Now, data is only half the battle. We actually need to build models as well. So we can build models for these one-off breaches. We can build models for cloud downtimes, for systemic ransomware, for non-affirmative cyber. We have lots of different techniques for doing that. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that we can think about modeling. But really, the key is looking at what is the point of aggregation. So is the point of aggregation a cloud? Is it an older, unpatched operating system? Is it a geography? We saw with NotPetya that it targeted tech software for companies that had Ukrainian infrastructure. So we can look at geography. We can look at all sorts of different points of aggregation, or more than one point of aggregation. And once we understand the points of aggregation, we look at the probabilities of infection. So if you meet the point of aggregation, that may not be enough to get the, the issue. We saw with NotPetya that not everybody who had the Ukrainian tax software got impacted. So we have a small probability that even if you meet the criteria, you may or may not be impacted. From there, we could start to think about consequence. And we did a lot of work with Lloyds of London on this over the past few years. We released a study with Lloyds called Cloud Down a few years back, which really studied the financial consequence of the cloud down, as the paper says. Uh, I do re I recommend checking that out. It's on Lloyds's website. Anybody can check that out. And then we bring that all together with the insurance aspect, the financial modeling of insurance terms, attachment points, limits, layers, all the different things that the insurance industry puts into these policies to come up with a, a robust insured loss. And these are distributions. We have a mean loss, of course, but we do have a distribution around the mean loss. So you can really see, okay, what is my 1 in 100, 1 in 1,000, 1 in 10,000? How bad could it possibly get for me as a company or me as an insurer insuring many companies? So, so I know that's a pretty short description of many years of modeling work that we've done, but that gives you a flavor for data and modeling that we're, we're thinking about as we're building these things. Thanks, Scott. I just like to hold that thought there about just talking about severe events on return periods and, and actually ask a question to the group um, in a minute. But um, we'd just like to pause there, if you don't mind, everyone, um, and we'd like to do the second poll. So as before, if you could go to slido.com on your device and use... Um, Ash SM5, there are um, two further questions for you all, please. Um, first one is, what role should the insurance industry play in helping customers manage the risk of a major infrastructure or utility failure? Um, please select two. And the second question, and what are the two key skills and capabilities that we need to improve as an industry to protect society against systemic risks? Again, select two. And as we're just waiting for, for those answers, um, one of the things I think we should just think of as a group, the, the, the panel, um, is where we have these extreme events, where the insurance industry has the capability to address some of them and where it's going to need a public and private sector to come together. Because um, if you look at COVID, I don't think the insurance industry could ever take that exposure on its balance sheet single-handedly. So. That's something we should try and discuss in the in the next set part of the session. Okay. And that is quite interesting because just coming on the back of that was transfer of products. And I think, Tracy, when you were talking about 
how the BT risk register has changed and how many of your perils are uninsurable now. I think that's a remit to the insurance industry to uh, really start innovating and trying to find products to come to risk managers like yourself. On is the highest one here is 83%, as you can see. And the other one, Scott, that's very interesting, you know, analytics and modeling services coming in second uh, at, at, with 49%. So I think it's very topical. We've got uh, both of you individuals on, on the panel. Um, the other one at the bottom, I guess, Sandra, is the alert and early warning services. Again, if we know something's going to happen, uh, to your point, the space weather's changing, we need to be ahead of the curve. And then the answers to um, question two, going to come in in a minute. Yeah. I think it's following on from that specialized risk knowledge is coming in at 60%. Interesting. Collaboration and risk partnership, again, maybe that's the public and private sector we can talk a bit about in a minute as well. I think that's going to be a very important area in the systemic risk analysis. Okay. Interesting. So, yeah, special, specialized risk knowledge, 60% of you. Collaboration and risk partner, partnering, 46%. So, not surprised at that. And then, actually... In innovation and entrepreneurship, 19%. So that is quite low, but I think what we're saying is we need to have the knowledge and we need to partner potentially public and private sectors to actually address some of these issues. So that, that is interesting. Good. Um, Luke, I'll just come to you for one final question before we go to the, um, the Q&A. It's really just picking up from your point about you know insurance working with government, and then I'd throw it out to... Um, the other panelists, Tracy, would be interested in your thoughts on that as to where the insurance industry should interact with government in addressing a lot of these um, these issues. Well, I, I think, Andrew, there's an awful lot of opportunities here. I suppose the approach that we've taken today, which has worked out quite well for us, is, is working with third parties with that technical expertise. So I, I quite like the results in the poll, actually, insofar as working with the subject matter experts. I suppose within the insurance world, we, we, we crown ourselves as being specialists in underwriting, pricing, claims, and so on. But then maybe we can partner with these tech companies out there who have quite rich data feeds in which we can use to kind of like monitor performance of uh, historical outages or just to further understand um, kind of the landscape of, of the different types of systemic risks out there. I think that's quite valuable. It, it's, it's the partnerships. And again, with the results on the poll, I, I don't think they're mutually exclusive because I must admit innovation was quite low, but I think they would work quite hand in hand with one another. And so far as you, you need to be innovative to look at policy wording and with the policy wording is the partnership with your, your third parties and, and so on. So I think they, 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 they work quite nicely with one another. Yeah, great. And Tracy, from your perspective, where, where, where do you see that gap between you know getting BT to what it needs to ensure um, from the standard market and, and 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 the government coming in to play. For yeah, it's a really interesting one, Andrew. I was quite disappointed um, having seen sort of the lack of traction on the COVID front in that respect. Okay, even though I do appreciate that most of the activity there was around the SME market and not necessarily the big global clients like myself. Um, I think I think there's every really opportunity there. I think we can look at other events and other risks that have been done very successfully. So if you think about terrorism, for example, you know, back in the early 90s, you know, nothing, uh, you know, obviously a problem for the market, um, uh, reached out to, to government, um, obviously did a lot of work together, and the end result was Paul Ree, okay, which has you know, been very successful. Um, and Paul Ree's still going today, of course, but now we have solutions from Lloyds and other players. So, again, a good, really good private-public partnership there. And then Floodry. So, again, you know, really good examples of, of, of where we successfully don't always get it immediately right on the first, yeah, the first launch. But, you know, I think you've got two very successful solutions there that have been, um, you know, well-embraced 
um, well thought through and, and work really well. So I say, why not? Why not look at others? You know, I think there's every opportunity. I, I agree. I think also picking up on Scott's point about the modelling, I think we should be modelling the data better and using all the modelling we can to actually get an informed discussion between risk managers like yourself, the insurance industry and governments, and certainly trying to do it uh, pre-in events, we get, we'll get a much more open arm sort of, okay, you're looking to address an issue. I think always trying to do something post-event is incredibly difficult and it's very fractious as we've seen with, with COVID. So I think we should all be um, looking at how we can address these issues going forward. So it's something we should, we should look to be working together on. Um, so thank you all for um, those specific questions. And we're now going to the audience um, Q&A. Um, so again, um, I've got a few that have come up here. Um, here we go. Um, the first one is, um, and I'm going to be very ignorant because I don't know what this event is. Do we have any sense of the impact of the famous Carrington event in 1859? It happened today in today's highly connected world. Um, now, I'm not sure who the best person to not answer that is because I don't actually know what the Carrington event is. So uh, I think, um, Scott, as a modeler, can you tell us what the Carrington event is, please? Is I think this is probably a question. It's probably a question for Sandra, given that it's 1859. Yep. I'm guessing it's space weather. Well, um, I'll, I'll, I'll give a fun little anecdote. Is that cyber insurance is covering data and the breaches. And actually, we have a historical database of cyber incidents. The earliest incident in that database is surprisingly in 1903. Because a person was riding a train in California carrying paper medical records, left them behind. So, so the 1859 doesn't mean it can't be cyber, but in this case... Well, I, I, I don't cyber agree. It's probably space, but I'm just wondering if I you've got help to go that far, far back in your model to 1859. <laughs> um, good. So, Sandra, presumably you could help us with that. Yeah, yeah. So, so the Carrington, this, this is very interesting and controversial. So oh. the Carrington event... Uh, so you've got to think about the quality of the data that we have to talk about these things. So basically, it was the Carrington event that, that encouraged people to start measuring the magnetic field on the surface of the Earth. So what happened, it was that Carrington noticed, he was a solar observer, he saw a flare on the sun, and a few days later, fantastic auroral displays, and telegraph wires, this is the technology, they remember long wires, sparking telegraph wires, running the telegraph system off of the power from the aurora. You didn't need to, need to plug it in, okay? And this went on for days. And he conjectured that, well, you know, the sun is driving this. And, of course, this was complete, very controversial, and people argued for, you know, until Airy died, basically, okay, about this. But they started then measuring the magnetic field on the surface of the Earth. So we, the measurements of the Carrington event, they actually, only recently, there's a, there's a nice paper uh, where... Um, somebody was at a conference and they were, it, it was in Mumbai and they said, oh, yeah, we got observations of this. They were looking at magnetized needles on threads suspended, okay, looking at them from a telescope on the other side of the room to see the tilt of the Earth's magnetic field. And from this they deduced there was a huge deflection, so you've got a one-point measurement. And there's a number we use called DST. It, it's the size of the magnetic deflection. And this was something like 1750 nanotesla. The other two events... The sort of the Quebec thing was like a few hundred, okay? So this was huge. But, of course, it was single point. Um, and so there's, there's been a lot of argument about how big was the event. Now, if you look back at other large events, subsequent to that, they started measuring the magnetic field over the surface of the Earth. And so, you know, I've looked back at this data. So other people have looked back at this data. This is 10 charts, by the way. 10 charts trying to measure what happened to the magnetic field. Um, and either you can say this event was in fact 1750, in which case it would be an absolute disaster, you know, complete power failure across the US. Or actually it's more like 850, which is a bit bigger than the 1921 event, okay? Um, if you, it depends how you interpret this very difficult data. If it's the smaller number, the important thing to take away is it fits in with the distributions of all the other events that happened since. So therefore, we know how likely it is. So if it's a smaller number, which is quite bad, but not end of the world, we know it's roughly a 150-year event, and we know what the physics is, and therefore we could probably eventually model it. If it's this really big number, it's a completely different category of events. We have no idea how frequently they occur. 
because it's different physics. It's actually, things have to correlate to make that happen. So it's a very controversial question to answer. So I'm going to go with, you know, as I say, if it's following the distribution of other large events, one in a 150-year event, something that would be bigger than Quebec, bigger than 1921, but of order, something you, you could, as I say, it's in this, 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 this large-scale event area, but as a, a lot of what happens in these very large events, we still could make our systems more resilient. You know, it's still a bit difficult, but it's not, you can't, it's not that you can do nothing, okay, but it's just expensive to make our systems resilient against it. But yeah, it, it's a very um, topical question, and people are very, you know, heated in their arguments about it, 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 it in most of the scientific community, okay? And Scott, you better put that in your model. <laughs> Guess so, yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting. Thanks, Sandra. Um, a, a question here, um, and, and Sandra, I'll give you a break because it's are you seeing a, a pattern in terms of certain parts of the world where such events um, are causing significant impact? And I'll, I'll throw this over to, um, to, to really to Tracy. I think from from a cyber standpoint, um, Scott's mentioned a lot of attacks, um, be it MERS, be it BA. Obviously. You know, ET have a huge exposure to this. But if you think about your infrastructure, what are you doing actually to mitigate it, not just from cyber protection, but in terms of the, you know, the underground cables, you know, if God forbid, tele telecommunications house in Docklands was to have a, an incident, are you looking at things like SpaceX, or, you know, satellite, uh, internet as well, um, and how much of, of your job now is really focused around cyber, cyber mitigation? Yeah, I mean, um, thanks for the question, Andrew. I think we're very, um, we're very, very fortunate at BT because um, we actually have a whole team um, based in security. So we have hundreds of people based in this area of our business for two reasons. First of all, to protect BT, okay, and our network and our systems, but also to sell security services and products to our customers, okay? And this is a side of the business that we have seen increase massively over the last 12 months, okay? So um, we are lucky enough to have, you know, to have a, a whole huge collection of individuals that are really out there up front and, um, you know, monitoring our network, understanding everything that's going on, understanding where the next threat is coming from and what we can do to assist BT and what we can do to assist our customers. And so that really uh, allows us, you know, almost a luxurious sort of approach to how we manage this on a day-to-day -day basis. But it's, it's something we spend an awful a lot of time and money on. And obviously, in respect of our responsibilities in the UK as a key provider, we also have responsibilities and um, understanding with the regulator. And we also have um, a, 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 you know, an agreement in terms of our operations with, with the, um, the government. So it is absolutely a huge area of focus for us. Thanks very much. And Luke, I guess just going on from that, um, the information that Sandra can impart to you as an underwriter when you're writing cyber, I mean, how much can you impart that sort of infrastructure into into the pricing and the, the risk management side? Well, I think it's extremely valuable. Uh, as I said, I think that's the beauty of maybe working with the subject matter experts who, who have a, a rich feed of data and so what we've done in instances of maybe cloud insurance, if you don't mind me referring back to the cloud downtime products we have, is synthesizing this data, looking at the frequency and severity of outages, and almost pricing that based on different CSP regions, cloud service provider regions, and really understanding the correlations and managing our ags in that capacity. But we think it's extremely valuable because, again, this is based that five, ten years ago, we were really collecting from, as, an, as an insurance company. And so it, it's quite key for us to kind of utilize this data to kind of make better informed underwriting decisions. Yeah, good. And um, Scott, when we talk about, we're talking about risk management there, um, one of the questions we've had is, um, excuse me, how do you manage risk aggregation for the types of the extreme tail events, in other words, bucket C, systemic risk, 
Um, do we simply have to work out the sum limits that we've granted for each peril? Um, or is there a way that we can monitor terrorists better? I think that's the question we're alluding to. Yeah, so, so I think that models have evolved quite a lot over the past few years, such that for some lines of business, you can go well beyond sums insured. I mean, uh, certainly for affirmative cyber policies, cyber in general, you can go down to the policy level, to the layer of the policy level, and really get a very good understanding of the risk to that layer of that policy. It's quite detailed. Uh, we're starting to expand this out to other lines now. In fact, we have a very active roadmap where we're looking to expand really going to de into detail on the property line and other key lines of business where we think the loss potential is super duper high. And I think a lot of this stems from, from these critical infrastructure attacks. I know one of the other questions sort of related to this is, are there examples of these things happening? Is this even a plausible situation? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. We've seen cases where this can happen. Uh, clouds fell. Uh, I'm not going to say all the time, but they fell pretty frequently. And we, we use the NIST framework for thinking about how clouds fell. So they can fall for environmental reasons, meaning a lightning strike on a data center. We saw that in Belgium with the Google data center. They were struck by lightning a few years back. Uh, the structural events, which are more the underlying infrastructure of a cloud. And in fact, many cloud failures are due to just underlying infrastructure. There's accidental events. We saw Amazon Web Services back in 2017 go down for several hours because one of their own employees made a typo, an accidental issue. And then, of course, there are adversarial things. So, so bad actors can do DDoS attacks. They can literally attack the, the infrastructure. A great example of that was back in 2016, where we saw Dyn DNS services uh, get a DDoS attack. Basically, what happened is um, the bad actors commandeered smart refrigerators, smart TVs, smart toasters, smart coffee makers, all of these quote-unquote smart devices. And instead of having them just turn on and off, they had the smart device contact Dyn servers, and Dyn servers couldn't ha handle millions of refrigerators talking to it all at once, and it caused them to fail. So, so there's definitely examples of this. Maybe not at the extremely or truly catastrophic scale. We haven't seen that yet. But there are certainly examples to show that it's plausible. Good. Thank you. I guess speaking of plausible, um, Sandra, one of the one of the questions is um, space weather. Should it be included um, in the internal insurance models? Um, obviously, I know Lloyd's do some work around looking at space events, but in terms of internal capital modelling, do you think that should be uh, in people's models? And what sort of scenarios do you think we should be putting in there? Um, I think the thing that would be really interesting is. Um, it seems to me, if we're thinking about the kind of um, what I called um, annoying and expensive, okay, so I think mo most, most things, most, most events will come into this category, and that includes things on the scale of Quebec, you know, a nine-hour power outage. If we think, think about things like that, it, it, you know, it would be really as part of the modelling to think about, well, how resilient is this system in the first place? Because, you know, power grids, particularly in the US, a lot of them are actually becoming not very resilient and there's lots of kinds of incidents of failures that are happening like in california they've got problems with power failures because the system isn't actually that resilient so some so it's how you model it but feeding that information in it seems to me is actually really important thinking about space weather because not all systems are equal okay so some are actually highly resilient you know uh, for all sorts of operational reasons, and some are not. So it's not just kind of things, oh, you know, how, how good is the quality of early warning information, but also how resilient the system is that you, you want to feed in. I think that could make a lot of difference in terms of outcome and how likely, you know, that the space where the event could be the same, but the actual outcome in terms of the impact could be very different. I don't know if that answers your question because I'm not an insurance person, of course. <laughs> no, I, I, think, I think it just needs people to be, you know, thinking about, you know, where you have your standard events going in. We need to be thinking about some of these sort of, you know, systemic events going into the model at some stage. I think it's and, you, and you have this information because you see how this, these systems have failed in the past. Yeah. I mean, I'm just thinking about power grids. You know, they fail quite a lot, you know, not big failures but they fail for all kinds of responses to natural hazards. So you kind of have the information that, that how resilient they are. Yeah. And there's, there's a question here which um, I'll throw out to the group. Um, are there examples of a cyber attack trying to take down power networks? I mean, obviously, we're talking at the moment a lot of them are malicious ransomware attacks, but 
networks, com communication systems, or cloud servers. Um, and again, I don't know, Tracy, whether you've obviously you've seen that might be happening um, on, on your watch or through Ermic, or again, Scott, if you've got any um, scenarios you could actually mention. Yeah, on the power side, we had a key example, again, in Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine seems to be a key target for these events. Um, but a few years back, the Ukrainian power grid was targeted, and it did go down. And in fact, it was a sophisticated attack, such that it was three-pronged. The bad actors made the power go down, which is bad enough. But then they also made it so that the, the engineers in the control room of the power facilities thought everything was normal. They set all the gauges at normal, at least from what they were seeing. And then they also took the, the call-in center, where people would call in to report their power outages and come and hear that, so that when the customers of the power were calling in to, to report the power outage, they got through to the bad actors who were like, oh, everything's fine. So, so the engineers didn't even know there was a problem. So that was a pretty sophisticated example. Um, again, it impacted Ukraine. You could imagine a broader scale system going down from a similar situation. Again, these things are all plausible because we have examples of almost anything you could imagine. I think from my perspective, I think where we are very focused is not our only area of focus. Of course, we focus on everything that, that we consider a risk, but um, big area of focus is for us is, is on uh, working up with you know, attacks on communication systems, um, the ransomware risk around uh, personal data. If you can imagine, we have a huge number of customers in the UK, private individuals, and a huge amount of personal data. Um, and that is, you know, that, that is particularly what I think the focus that has been historically, not to say that it will be moving forward, but that's historically been the focus on, you know, talk, talk and communication providers is, is the attraction of their database. Scott, a quick question, very quick. The report you mentioned um, about the cloud, was it, what was it called? Downtime, was it? Cloud Downtime? Uh, yeah, so the report we did with Lloyd's is called Cloud Down. It's a very simple URL to get to it. It's www.lloyds.com slash cloud down. C-L-O-U-D-D-O-W-N, two Ds in a row. www.lloyds.com slash cloud down. And then there's a little button down there to download it. Uh, just click download an emerging risk report from Lloyd's Innovation. Uh, it's a very detailed report. goes into a lot of details about how we think about modeling cloud downtimes. Good. Thank you. And I think that rounds out all the questions we've got on the, on the Q&A. Um, I'd just like to um, well, personally thank the, the panelists. I think it's been an extremely productive talk. And just to really sort of get the participants of, of, of this um, masterclass, thinking about, one, the ever-changing risk profile we're all facing. Think about how we're going to adapt our insurance products to actually work with our customers going forward and actually understand the exposures and look at them. And I think um, everyone here has made a, a, a very profound statement about certain things that really was brought home to me last week, and I sat on a, um, a far side chat with um, Scott Kirby, who's the United Airlines CEO, um, and he made a point that a few years ago people kept talking about the worst case scenario, and he said, every time you come to me with the worst case scenario, it is always from an event that's just happened, be it the Ash Cloud, be it World Trade Center, be it something like this. What do you think the worst case scenario is? Because there is no worst case scenario because we've never seen it. You need to go away and think about scenarios that could absolutely take this airline down. And they went away and came back with something not as profound as the, the uh, COVID-19 situation, but it's certainly something that was far more extreme than the airline had been exposed to at any point in time. And I think that's what we need to do as, as industry, both in the insurance sector and the private sector and the public sector, is to think about that as to what the extreme scenarios are. And so today's been so important to actually get us to think about cyber, real systemic cyber attacks and also space attacks. So I'd like to really thank the, um, the panelists for all their input. It's been um, hugely successful um, on that. Um, and also, um, there'll be a lot of um, data sent around after this that you can, um, you can pick up. Uh, again, as, as Scott said, you can go to the website and do that. Um, but as I said, thank you all the panelists, thank you all the guests 
for uh, dialing in. Um, hopefully you found this very thought-provoking. To thank Lloyd's, um, again, and the CII for their partnership in this. Um, and to wish you uh, all a good day, and thank you very much for attending. Um, I do believe there's another session um, on April the 27th. So, again, if you haven't registered for that, um, please do. Um, and once again, thank you to the panellists, and thank you all for attending.